beginnen? Mag ik gewoon beginnen? Ik ga gewoon beginnen. Ik ga gewoon beginnen met een foto van jullie. Ik vind dit wel grappig. Oké. Okay. Um, anybody not speaking Dutch? Perfect. I have no excuse to switch from Dutch to English mid talk. I'll just start in English. Because <laughs> I know if I start in Dutch, I'm going to switch to English at some point anyhow without even realizing it. So. Okay, Kuhn told me to just go for it, and that's what I'll do. Um, this talk is titled Help My Data Centers on Fire because that's exactly the call I got on March 10, 2021, at just before 4 o'clock. One of our uncalled engineers and escalated like, hey, are you? Joke. Uh, partially pushed off my phone, was like, and then you wake up like, what did he really say? Wait, oh fuck, I wasn't dreaming. This was really the on-call engineer who escalated to me. Like, okay, let me go downstairs. You open up your laptop, well, laptop is, you unlock your laptop like, oh fuck. <laughs> and this was the first tweet I read. Hmm. So yeah, our data center was on fire. Story. Which is this a horror story? Here's a bunch of people who think it's a horror story. It's it's not. So my name is Chris Batard. Um, I've spoken at NL conferences before. I actually don't know when the last time was, but whatever. Um, ages ago, and I'm one of those people who get here also because my hair is disappearing. Um, I used to be a developer. Um, been all kinds of crazy languages like Perl, C, whatever, you know. And then I became an operations person. And for the past, whatever, 20 plus years, I've been helping people to use open source to build and deliver and scale and fix their infrastructures. My blog is titled Everything is a Fucking Problem. People typically curse at me when they realize I'm right. And next to uh, actually running Inuits and Oli. Oli is a focusing on open source observability. Uh, so we do all stuff with Prometheus, that ecosystem. Um, I also made a mistake 12 years ago together with Patrick Dubois to start Ops Days in Ghent and that thing went global um, with Toshan and Config Management Camp and Load Day. And uh, well, we're running Config Management Camp again. So everybody, please come to Ghent in February. Um, so, when you're in IT, you think like, oh, our data center, that's going to be the biggest problem we'll ever find. And then you see this is a news, 3.6 million websites. These are the actual pictures of the data center. It's like, hmm, it's not fun. And our immediate, what is broken? What, what happened? Which customers do we have? Because we, as Inuits, we run a number of applications. Open source applications. So there's production workload on there. 20 plus different customers. And we're like, okay, so what is the impact? What actually happened? And not much. So we what happened really that we depend on? And how do we start fixing these? Revenue platforms which actually have impact and visibility, and that's kind of the list at that moment. Because, well, everything is red, everything is on fire, you think. So, that immediate assessment for us was like, actually, we've built things high available by design, data centers. Most of our stuff filled over, except for the one IP API call, move to another data center, but the endpoint. So that didn't work. And then we had one customer that was actually, well, it spread over the data center. Strasbourg 1, Strasbourg 2. Why didn't that work? gone. And then the 
the last thing we realized was like, oh, that customer's DR side is actually completely gone. That was our initial assessment within the first 10, 15 minutes. So, the failing virtual IP address. IP address data center. We'll just use another IP address, change the DNS, right? And then traffic is going to be directed where? Of the records of all the services that were impacted? Except for the one domain zone. <laughs> <clears throat> Who actually could update that IP address? Well, that's the Contact details of the person who had the admin credentials to the UI where we could update that one A record. So that was pretty smooth. And then we had some customers who called it, they actually had public IP addresses hard coded. Like, it's another DNS problem. It turned out they weren't actually because they had one that failed over. But they were like, yeah, we see you have a problem. Actually, it was in the afternoon only. So we, we had some development instances that needed to be reconfigured, but not production. That was good. So the one customer that was actually within the Strasbourg data center on two different data centers, well, we, we kind of set two physical data centers, two completely physical buildings, but then when the fire arrives on the campus and says, well, we're just going to turn off the power on the whole campus, hmm, you're still screwed. So around 4 a.m., 5 a.m., they didn't have anything. By 9 a.m., they were up and running again at a different cloud provider. We just respun their infrastructure, took the last backup, which was off-site, and we were looking at improving the performance of their stack. And if we wouldn't have called them, they would not have realized that they were in a fire. So we spent a bit too much time figuring out what the actual performance problem was. Turned out it's not a fucking DNS problem, it was an MTU problem. Um, because we switched from ISP and network settings were slightly different and that was the one thing we overlooked in our config. So that was also pretty good. So in total, we actually in that fire lost about 140 PMs, trading physical services. For some organizations, we know we had neighbors in that data center. For them, it basically meant bankruptcy. It looks like a lot more than 13 servers. Yeah, well, there's more people in that data center than just us. Okay. <laughs> I mean, this is OVH. OVH is one of the providers, just like Hetzner and Scaleway and who else? And of Amazon and uh, Hetzner and not Amazon and Azure ones. So this is actually the data center that was on fire. And we have some stuff in there. Everything. I mean, we're not at that scale. Well, not in a way. So we lost a bit, but I mean, the, the first slide I had was the number, large number with how many websites were impacted. It was not our impact. We were only having a subset there. Um, what actually happened was that apparently there was some you and what we saw happening in our monitoring is that we saw as of 11 o'clock in the evening we saw the temperature of some CPUs grow and we actually already saw services being migrated away from the data center to another location and services already being degraded at one point effectively Stuff was really on fire and the power got cut. Internally, we had a couple of development services that were gone, our next cloud, our GitLab, uh, parts of test ecosystems, parts of our Kube cluster. Um, that was actually a good thing, because nobody needs Kubernetes. <laughs> yeah, that's that's why do people keep running it if this is the reaction you get when they say it on stage? You get an applause when you say nobody needs Kubernetes and still everybody uses it. But that's another talk. That's another talk. So we kind of survived. Fire department had much more work than we had. We had about 
actually it was the on call engineer and me who just worked through the morning to 12 o'clock when we just said hey the rest can take over and basically we, we spent about 18 hours uh, with a couple of people um, two engineers in the morning and four or five who joined for the recovery daytime we lost some time spending most getting with people and restoring backups we talked and at 9 10 there was another customer who said hey i cannot access file systems turned out there was this one alert in the chaos of big alerts where one cluster cluster we didn't realize was actually failing we fixed that by single mounting our cluster data don't do that in production uh, but we had access to the data um, that was kind of solved it then we didn't lose the data because three months later there was this one application our internal candidate application tracking system where the users were complaining about not being able to and we're like, um, we reprovisioned this through the fire, we restored the backups. Well, what do you mean you can't access the files? Well, turned out the good development team months before had fixed a long standing bug where they initially were uploading the resumes and all the files attachments into the database, and we were said, no, don't do this. They fixed it, they put them on a local system and never told anybody. <laughs> So we never backed up those files because we didn't know. The good thing is you can, in Belgium, only keep resumes and stuff for three months or the GDPR compliant again. <laughs> and some people learn that if they write stuff on local disks, they should actually tell people so we can either take backups or things clustered. So that was a tiring day, but there's a lot of lessons to be learned from that. Like, we started restoring things, we started verifying if our secondary nodes would still have sufficient place to have backups because a bunch of our clusters now were, now were now basically running on just one leg. But every as if it's normal. So 20 years later, backups. And some of those backup nodes might not have been provisioned as primary backup nodes. So, thing we needed to prevent. Uh, obviously, we found a couple of things there. Like, we quickly started spinning up disks. And then we started inventorizing, like, okay, what do we really so that we can continue doing development? Because we do continuous delivery, we have pipelines, which means a developer commits something, builds something, it's getting deployed to, oh, a missing development cluster. What do we mean it will need to, to get these things going? Obviously, and not just at that one supplier, everybody was looking for hardware in different suppliers, in different data centers. So there was a real shortage in compute power, and not only at OVH. We were happy to have some hearts were running already in different providers so we could use that not sufficient and we were like looking in the middle of the heat what about we just go for a third party what about we just add yet another supplier because we were already a cloud supplier and well that's a really bad idea if you're in the middle of the heat because you need to figure out how to do networking with them how to do failover with them and basically we have enough room already so we wasted a couple of times here. So what's the next thing? Okay, everything popping up. And you see the supplier saying, well, not everything went up in fire. We just powered down some things. And there are things where when we have checked them, we're gonna go room by room and you might be getting some of your services back. So what do you want to reprovision? And what do you expect to come back? Or in what state is the cluster going to be if they suddenly start powering on things again? You could get really weird things where you expect four node clusters or five node clusters and they suddenly have two more because, hey, people are powering on things again. How do you fence things you don't know that exist? Eventually, that didn't turn out to be a problem. The three servers we got back in the long run that took the month to 
before we got them back and they announced pretty clearly like power them on when you want to but it was like what if they powered them on before um, what do we need to power on before we can actually get all of the developers to work together so those were questions that we never You don't get to experience the fires in the data center every got every other week. And the other thing we also bumped into that one customer that didn't have a DOS is how fast do you want to spin that up? What is the odds that the other fires data center is also gonna go on fire? And we had chats with him like, do we take this risk? We run without the DR site for a couple of weeks. How long do you wanna run? I mean, spinning things up, we do infrastructure code, made it easy to, to spin it up. It was just some time, but you need to. What are we going to lose if we <laughs> fail again? And what is the chance that you're going to fail again? So we survived. But what really saved us? And, of five things. Um, the first one is infrastructure as code. And with real infrastructure as code, I'll talk about it later. Real infrastructure as code and not the thing a lot. Um, it is about architecture, it is about backups, but also about the engineers that are on call realizing escalating it and actually doing this. Real infrastructure as code. When we talk about real infrastructure as code, we talk about this state. And it doesn't matter which tool, we've been using Puppet for and Puppet is for us. But it really is about defining what your infrastructure should look like and ensuring it always looks like that and not tolerating manual changes. And that allowed us to just spin up things again we knew they were going to be the way we wanted. Um, we had friends in data centers next to it who had no state, who had such risk code, they told, but they couldn't even provision a server anymore. They had some Ansible playbooks which deployed a package, but not the rest. They had multiple teams that needed to be involved into deploying an application because they had the layer where the application, the infrastructure was spun up, they had database, middleware, and then three, four teams to spin things up. No, when we do infrastructure as code, it's going to be the operating system, all the way up to clusters, data provision, everything. And not, well, we're ready, now it's on our team's responsibility. So we managed to spin this up just one person. There was nobody else involved. So, Define a VM, attach its role. Uh, depend on single and puppet that means puppet DB, and that we use to reconfigure firewalls, proxies, the monitoring, everything. If we move to the data center, configured. If we move it to another supervisor, if to some, it's get reconfigured. And I'll. One but last thing, we deploy from our own local repositories. The ones we have under control, not some third party that might be down because they're all center in a fire. We deploy from our own YUM repositories. Everything we build, everything we package can be reused. And all of that is automated. Everything is a pipeline. Every single config file, every single DNS entry, so there's no manual people configuring things. It's like you commit something, it's being deployed. And that saved us because we spun up customers again in less than four hours. They didn't realize. The second thing is we're not cloud naive. I mean, we don't want to spend 10 times the money on AWS or on Azure or on Google Cloud, there's a bunch of European cloud providers that allow you to 
use an API, pay on demand as you do, and scale out when you need to. I mean, I've listed Hetzner or OVH, but there's a way there's, there's a bunch. And they're effectively cheaper than the big brands. Sure, you're gonna fail, but Google is failing, Amazon is failing, Azure is failing, they're all gonna fail. They're gonna null right themselves anyhow, because that's what happened with Azure two weeks later. And that was much bigger news. You spin them up, you decommission them, you find things in code, could be Terraform, could be whatever, and you make sure you can spin things up. It's different from what people are doing on EC2. It's another provider, sure. And the invoice at the end of the month is a bit less. Multi-cloud, because we moved from OVH to Headster. We could spread things to somewhere else. The disaster recovery site is actually with a different supplier. And we could actually spin up those workloads completely on Azure or somewhere else. Data center. Well, now we actually think because when we were first looking at Strasbourg, Roubaix, and Strasbourg 1, and Strasbourg 2, and Strasbourg 3, looking at the pictures, it's a different building. Well, now we actually want physical geographically spread campuses 100 kilometers apart. Does it matter for applications? For most, it doesn't. So, they are cloud native because we can build things redundantly. We expect things to fail. We expect things to disappear. Um, but we standardize and open. Um, you think the public cloud providers do that for you? I see some people nodding this way. Real high availability. Multi-availability zones, well, that... If you pay a lot of money, you get the poor man's failover, which basically is a distributed replicated disk, but... <laughs> which is not... What the other key thing is user-generated data. We succeeded because everything we knew that was generated base was being built up. And I focus on everything we knew. Because people, if they don't tell you that things exist, then you can't make backups for them. And we try to build things in a way that it's cloud agnostic. This is not cloud agnostic. A VM is a VM. You can move things around. You can still run containers inside, but you're tied to your supplier. There are specific things like how do you move a virtual IP address from left to right? How do you deal with certain parts uh, of the networking stack? But if you build things like this, you can actually move them around from different cloud providers. And we, we did that. Uh, we moved things that we built that run internally and we deployed them on Azure. All nomad stacks, which we can just deploy on Azure, where people say, hey, want to run Cube on, on uh, GK on, on Google next week? Sure, we'll do that. So you're not tied to this vendor. And the other part of being cloud agnostic is that if you design different patterns and you make them in first code and you make them repeatable, each stack is really a code base that lives on it. And if you make base, you limit the blast radius just for that customer for that project. And you might have multiple variants of that code base and multiple instances, but you're never going to build things all the way. Even before containerization to running things in, a single VM has a single purpose, which meant there's no database with web server with some queuing system all running in one system. It's a couple of nodes server, a couple of nodes for a database, a couple of nodes for the queuing system. If one of them fails, it's one of them that fails, not three different services that fail at one. 
So single purpose clusters, single purpose storage clusters, like the one cluster cluster that failed, that was the one cluster. Not a huge, large Ceph cluster. When it fails, it's going to impact everything in your infrastructure. And if you can spin up multiple instances of those clusters because you've automated everything. Same with single purpose load balancers. Most IP addresses failed over to the other side, most clusters failed over to the other side, except the one single exception. So 95% of everything just failed over, it worked automatically and it wasn't impacted. If that would have been one huge reverse proxy, one single load balancer, then the impact would have been much, much bigger. Your impact to reduce the complexity because you actually Our design up for multiple data centers, um, I think I kind of already said this, uh, we want multi-campus, but you do want multi-data center. We work with our development teams to always build availability in first, like no local storage, no local file access. You want things like clusters have the RBD in there. You want to have MySQL clusters, you want to have Postgres clusters with Patroni, and you want the replication being in there. Um, I should change this to open search. Uh, please don't use Elastic anymore. Um, so yeah, that's also all built in. And for open search, I do backups or we are able of regenerating the data that's in there. And we have sense of queuing running. So everything we deploy, except for a bunch of internal applications, you know, like the Schumann thingy, is clustered by default. Everything customer facing is clustered by default or we don't want to run it. Storage. Well, we don't have distributed shared storage for our VMs. All our VMs spin up from local disks. We can reprovision them. We don't even do RAID because we spread data over multiple disks over multiple servers. Why would we want to have RAID under there if we're actually already copying it over the network a couple of times? Um, and the idea of the VMs, when you spin them up, So things like Ceph, DRBD, they're all in there. Our backups, definitely what's there, that are both on-site and off-site. Because obviously if the backup server was in the data center that was on fire, we could not have reprogrammed things. It was at some other supplier. I mean, I know for a bunch of you, this sounds like default, right? But not for everybody. <laughs> Documentation is a Git repository, MKDocs based, which lots of engineers have a local copy on their own laptop. So they can locally run MKDocs and read the documentation. If they've done a Git pull, they have the last version. It's not somewhere hidden in some online wiki tool which they cannot access when there's something which is wrong. You didn't need that, but who knows what? Be needed. But people have the documentation locally, you need to. Now, not everything was perfect. Um, we, we, we learned a couple of things. Like, when we sat down to do our post mortem, um, we started realizing that we were really lucky that we were already ready for our next project that we weren't starting yet, but that we had already spun up because that allowed us to quickly move a bunch of workloads there. And since then, we actually have always more resources available than we need at the moment. So there's always a bunch of machines we're paying extra just to be able to scale out faster, to spin up things faster in case there is a shortage in hardware. Um, what we see with every supplier is that at some point they're going to say, well, Yes, typically you get 120 seconds to spin up a new instance of something, but this week it's going to take longer. And we kind of have things spread over in, in multiple data centers available. Is that my time or is that? 
No, that's just somebody's forgetting his phone. <laughs> um, oh, we're still. The other thing is that when people say it's a data center, it might not be a data center. So you really learn to look at what it means with a data center, and whether that is just a building or a campus, um, it's different. The other thing you learn is, yes, we focus on things like customer facing. Yes, we focus on the things that initially make revenue, but we also wanted to make sure that the tools internally, the tools you think you don't need to have high available, you do need to have them high available. Um, we started clustering things that we figured out if those were impacted, our YUM repositories, we could restore them. We could have a static instance up and running of our pulp pretty fast. And it wasn't impacted. It would have taken us about two hours longer. <coughs> And we want to cut those two hours. So now we have those instances spread over the data centers. Um, our cube cluster crashed. Um, we finally decommissioned it a couple of years ago. Um, but in that ecosystem, we, we figured out that there was a lot of more moving parts that we would need to make much more resilient if we wanted to spin that up again. Um, we could spin up a stack pretty fast, but all the dependencies in there, much more complexity. We realized that once again, everything is a fucking DNS problem. <laughs> and on, on more than one occasion. And if it wasn't, it was an MTU problem. For me, the lesson there to those two things was you really have a team that understands our applications run. Our on-call team is opt-in. Um, people want to be part of the on-call because nothing happens and if it really happens they have a story to tell. Um, and that's basically what happened. March 10, 2021 for some people, was the biggest disaster of all. For us, for the but we survived it, and for a bunch of our customers, actually, that meant it was a success story because they realized this is how you need to build things. This is how you actually need to build things. You don't need to have paperwork that says how you do it if you can just prove how to do it. <coughs> but still, if things are on fire, where's your developers gonna be? It's still an ops problem. That was pretty much a story I wanted to tell. <laughs> so before you get to questions, fire day. Toshan, you don't have enough monitoring because I sent you text messages when things go down. <laughs> so you don't know if your data center is on fire. <laughs> so who else did think it was going to survive? How many hands did I see? Five? Some people go like, maybe, maybe, maybe. So what are you going to do to fix that? <laughs> I, I didn't get that joke. But. It's a money issue. It's a money issue. It's not a money issue. This is not a money issue. Preparing is. Preparing it is, is in a way a money issue but it's also a design issue um, but it, it's okay you, you build things clustered so that costs time but it's not an actual money issue because if you if I look at what we pay for our operational cost what our operational cost is that is with people included less than what most people pay to Amazon and Azure 
and things. Much, much, much less. It's a money allocation issue, yeah, yeah. Cool. So you may have been surprised that I did not raise my hand. That a data simplifier, but the answer is actually a bit more sophisticated. Mm -hmm. so, uh, first, it depends which data center. Um, and the other thing is that we have a little bit more uh, strict view on how much open source. Reason we don't use these because they're not built out of source software, and that makes it ten times harder to get the resilience that you want because you have to have your own hardware, mm -hmm. you have to have your own routing infrastructure, yep. you have to have your fiber optics. You have yep. then, but we do have multiple data centers. In, in the redundant way and stuff, and we are going to be raising our hand in May. That's a problem. So that talk next year? Yeah, could be. <laughs> <laughs> so we have cloud providers. We don't have our own hardware. We don't do the network part. That is definitely a trade-off. I mean, if you really want all of that to be, I mean. I'm pretty sure that most of the providers we work with, I'm not saying Amazon and Azure and Google, the stuff we depend on, I'd be surprised if less than 95% would be open. Yeah, well, that's not enough. It's so we want our routers to be open source. We want yeah, to okay. To be open source. We want everything. Of the software we run, the software we run, we are reaching 99.9% .9 of things completely open. But not on hardware. But not on hardware, no. no. There are solutions for that. <laughs> there are solutions for that, yeah. Next time things are down, I'm going to start calling you. <laughs> or your wife, you can choose. <laughs> More questions? <laughs> Yes. You wrote something specific about uh, putting all your databases externally or separately from the VMs that uh, So yeah, but we really run with the principle one service per VM. So what we see is a lot of people say, hey, we have this application, it's a LAMP application, there's an Apache, there's a MySQL, there's some file search and all in, inside of one VM. And we specifically don't do that, so one application means there's an Apache with PHP or with Python, uh, whatever. There's a database cluster, there's an HA proxy cluster, and they're all individual. So say that one or one hypervisor would fail, you fail maybe the front end, but you don't fail all three components. And that means that the simplicity of building your cluster algorithms, like which, in which case do you fail over, it's going to be much easier because it's individual resources and they're not grouped and tied together. And then at the same time, you wrote that for every customer, every project, you've got your own little clusters. So yep. that would mean then that you set up a database cluster for every project? Yes, and even per environment. So development, acceptance, production, shadow production, that's three different database clusters. And they're all automated, so I don't care. Because it's basically defining, I need these seven nodes. Fill in the host names and IP addresses, maybe some local tunings, and it's being spun up. Uh, I heard a lot that you have a lot of hosts. I wonder what kind of IP addressing are using it, and have you run out of IP addresses for them? No, we've not run out of IP addresses again. It's still, I mean, we're. Just RFC 1918 addresses and IPv6 is not something we worry about. Um, I don't think I'll ever have to deal with that problem before I retire. Yes? How about insurance? Can you insure such stuff and what do they pay out or is it not possible? Um, no clue. <laughs> I have no clue about insurance to this. Uh, I mean. OVH probably might have a huge insurance discussion with their insurance, but for us it was not something we cared about. Did, did OVH is 
Yeah, yeah, they've survived. They're, uh, they're. I mean, I'm, I'm not selling OVH or Hetzner, but look at their numbers. They're not small companies. Um, they survive these things. They might have gone to a bad patch or to a rough period, but they're large enough to not have to worry about this. Well, they're probably worried about this, but they're still in business and they're growing. To really fail over, the is going to be network and routing. But if we really want to spin up things, or if I need 100 instances tomorrow, the local European cloud providers are going to be able to do that. That's where I see AWS and Google really shine. And that's where you use them. But it's, it's going to be more expensive, but it's going to be for a shorter amount of time. So we have active there we can provision things there we do that once in a while but basically if you spin up your credit card and you reach the initial limits they have well we don't have contracts with them like negotiations or stuff just like it's just credit card spin up things there was a question yeah. in the back uh, maybe this is a bit of a newbie question uh, how do you deal with uh, making sure that the nodes are not all on the same physical server? Because we provision the VMs. So we actually... That's during the architecture of the stack, that's the initial planning. We say, we're going to spin this in data. These parts of the cluster, we're going to put them on those hypervisors. That's part of the manual stuff. Yeah. Okay. But that's just thinking front on how to, to provision things. How do you go about uh, preparing for multiple cloud providers? Let, let's say, for example, uh, uh, I've written the uh, infrastructure in, let's say, Terra. Uh, so, do you write your plan for both providers? Or? No, because the form in your code base, it's about this part compared to the so switching a provider and actually instantiating the VMs, that's something we only do when we just say we're going to spin up this stack in this provider. Um, the actual what's running where, how it's being defined, that's done in Puppet. And that is the whole part, the whole thing that makes sure you can be provisioned. But once you spin up a VM, we've got templates for different cloud providers to spin up a set of VMs on their specific networks with groups and all the things that we have lying around, but then it's just a matter of filling in the specifics. Okay. So we, we tested a bunch of those things, we, we spin things up left and right, but are typically not long running. And um, we don't want to do that, like I said, we, we tried to actually go for a third supplier, um, and that was a really bad idea, because you then lose indeed how do you provision things, what do you get by default, how does the networking work, how does security work, that is something you do want to have prepared. So you want to be able to just have multiple suppliers and then maybe have some scale out and third or fourth providers. And I think that was either a sign for two more minutes or two more questions. One more minute, I guess. So unless you folks have more questions, thank you.